Thanks for joining us online. We really are grateful for the opportunity to be able to connect with you. Whether you're a regular here at LBCC, perhaps you're another follower of Jesus and you're just stopping in to see what we're doing, or maybe you're a person who's curious about the teachings of Christianity and the things that Jesus had to say. Our aim is simple as a church. First, we want to connect you. Connect you to Jesus, that is, who is the source of all life and goodness. And while we're doing that, we want to connect you to community because community is God's idea and everyone's better off when they're with other people. Secondly, we want to help you grow as a person. People are meant to grow. We're meant to improve and learn and grow and mature as people. When you grow in your relationship with God, it becomes dynamic and changes your life. When you grow in relationships with other people, it helps you have a full life and purpose in life. That brings me to the third aim. Our third aim is to help you invest your life in something bigger than yourself. Everyone knows that, that if we look inward, we often get lost and lose our moorings. But it's the people that take their lives and, and do something with it, invest in something way bigger than themselves, that know that they have purpose and meaning in their life. Of course, the gospel is the greatest thing you could invest your life in. It's a, it's a mission, it's a, a goal that goes well beyond you. But you should also be investing in your family, in your town, in your, any place in your community you can. When you do these three things, connect, grow, and invest, your life is on the kind of track that it should be. Thank you again for joining us online. Here are some of the ways you can connect, grow, and invest at LBCC. We host breakfasts for women and men on the second and fourth Saturday mornings of every month. You can sign up at lbcovenant.org slash welcome slash upcoming dash events. Also, check out our life groups, a great way to meet and get to know us better. Some meet in person, others on Zoom, either weekly or a couple of times a month. Of course, visit our website or call the office at 732 870-2028 to get info or ask for prayer. We'd love to help you in any way we are able. Now here's today's sermon. I want to start, well, Tony mentioned that this is the end of our, our series that we did, Finding Your Place in God's Big Story. And we've been looking at every book of the Bible and sometimes uh, portions of scripture that give us everything that we need for that. And 26, 26 or 27 messages that we've done on that. And this is Revelation. And uh, I was uh, cast this to uh, talk about. And I haven't mentioned that this is the end of that series. We will, I will be teaching the book of Revelation in the fall. We'll start in September. I go to South Africa in August, come back the end of August, and we'll start this in September after I'm over jet lag. Someone sent me um, this text this morning, and I think it really is fitting. Uh, actually, they sent it to me yesterday, and it's from uh, C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. It said, it's easy to think that church has a lot of different objects, education, building, missions, holding services, just as it is easy to think the state has a lot of different objects, military, political, economic, and whatnot. But in, in a way, things are much simpler than that. The state exists simply to promote and to protect the ordinary happiness of human beings in this life. A husband and wife chatting over a fire, a couple of friends having a game of darts in a pub, a man reading a book in his own room, or digging in his own garden. That is what the state is there for. And unless they are helping to increase and prolong and protect such moments, all the laws, parliaments, armies, courts, police, economics, etc., are simply a waste of time. In the same way, the church exists for nothing else but to draw men into Christ, to make them little Christ. If they are not doing that, all the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, even the Bible itself, are simply a waste of time. God became man for no other purpose. That's Brother Lewis. Yeah, I just, I just thought it fit with what we're dealing with and how we're dealing with it. So um, we're looking at God's big story, 
and I don't want to get distracted by that too much. <clears throat> so if you're here for the first time, there are two other messages up on the church's website, I'm sorry, their YouTube channel, as well as on mine. Uh, that's Ray Sierra Ministries on YouTube. You could see the first two that I've done, plus uh, I had the privilege of interviewing Jim Wallace on Monday, which uh, we spent over an hour together, I think, or close to an hour, and doing that interview. Shameless plug. That was what that is. Just... Okay, so to sum up, what we've been looking at is could be seen this way, that we, we looked at the enmity between the woman's seed and the serpent seed. And to me, biblical theology, I'll explain that in a minute, is really the way to understand and interpret the Scripture. You have to have a context to really interpret things. And if your context, if you don't think there's a context, you're never going to come up with the right, the right things. And you still can end up in the wrong place. But you have to have this context that the whole of Scripture is the story about how God redeems us from this enmity between the seed of the woman and the serpent seed. And so Revelation basically is built on that. And uh, I, I suggested the first week that you spend, you know, read, read through Revelation every day. It takes about 20 minutes, unless you stop someplace and start to try to figure out what the heck they're talking about. Um, it's about a 25-minute, 30-minute sit-down to read, just go through it. Start in the beginning and just read. It's a, really a short book. It's the, the content that gets us um, stopped. So what, we, what we've seen is in John's revelation, we look at the seen and the unseen. I'm putting these into my own words, that the way that I see the book of Revelation, this is obviously my interpretation, and how you interpret Revelation is a non-essential. Let me just say that again. How you interpret Revelation is not an essential interpretation. There are more than a few, and I showed you some of them the first week, the way people do this. Um, I think that one of the things that I want to talk about this morning is the already but not yet, and there's a typo already. That's because I was typing this out this morning. There's the already but not yet, and then there's the fulfillment and consummation. So those are the things that we understand or we can see in the book of Revelation. And then the first week I talked about this view of the end times, what we call eschatology, which is the view or how we interpret how things will end. And my persuasion is I am what they call amillennialism or an amillennialist or an amillennialarian, easy for me to say. And amillennialism didn't really show up as a title until the beginning of the 20th century. It was considered postmillennialism before that. And we're talking about that thousand-year reign that's in the chapter between 20 and 22, this, this whole story of the millennium, or at least chapter 20 talks about the, the thousand-year reign. And that's the Latin word for a thousand years, a millennium. Yeah, come back in September, and we'll deal with this in a more, more depth. We'll see that. Here's what amillennialists believe. We believe that, that the millennium is, is a present reality centered in Christ's heavenly reign today, not a future hope of Christ's rule on the earth after his return. Okay, that... that it, Briefly is. Books written on this. Um, if you have anything to do with what's going on, you think what's going on in the Middle East is a time clock for the return of Jesus. And last week and the week before, I said, I quoted the verse from Matthew 24, I believe it is, at what? No man knows the hour, not the angels of God, not even the sun. So if you think you know when Jesus is coming back, you, you're saying you know more than Jesus. It's in, the, it's in the Bible. I didn't make that one up. Okay. So here, here's another way to interpret this whole idea. General revelation is, is God exists and we can see his existence in what's been made. Romans chapter 1. 
verses 18 through the end, or somewhere in that area, chapter, uh, verse 20 of that there, that chapter. Uh, in contrast, the general revelation, here's what my interpretation of the scriptures. The scriptures are the self-revelation of God in human history, finding your place in God's big story, unfolding a series of events in which God speaks and acts to redeem sinful men and women. So the whole Bible is this human history that unfolds in a series of events where God speaks and acts and he redeems us from our sinfulness. And that's basically what we're going to unfold. Uh, I was asked to put this thing up, this chart up again of what amillennialists, amillennialists believe. That, that basically is our chart. Uh, present age, we're in the millennium now. The consummation is not yet. Christ's return, there'll be a general resurrection of the righteous and the wicked and then final judgment. And then we'll go into the new heavens and the new earth. So that is the already but not yet. There are things that are fulfilled in Jesus. They're fulfilled in Christ, and, but they're not consummated. We haven't seen the end of that. When Jesus saw the Gentiles had come to talk to him, he said, now's the time. Now's the time. He said, the, the Son of Man has to be like that seed that's sown into the ground. And then um, when he's lifted up, he will draw all men unto himself. When, when John sees the, the revelation, he brings that into his gospel. By the way, the gospel of John is written after the revelation. And you can see how John says things like the light of the world, um, the lampstand in Revelation. You see those things, how he ties those back together. And we, we understand that, that John quotes Jesus saying, at that time, now is the, the ruler of this world cast down. And he's talking about his resurrection. He's talking about his crucifixion and resurrection. And we'll see how that works, how that comes out of Revelation in a minute. Um, but you, you recognize that, that John has seen something, and now we're seeing it in the gospel. And you see the continuity of Scripture there. But here's how I would interpret this. Now, I did have this chart, which was a little bit more exact, Christ is presently reigning in heaven, triumphed over spiritual, of the spiritual kingdom of God uh, in the midst of and rise of evil in opposition to Christ and his kingdom. And the promises made to Abraham, Israel, and David are fulfilled in Christ or his church. We dealt with that, and again, we'll deal with that more often. And then what I did was I gave you the seven visions that are in, in Revelation and how they are they are um, placed one on top of the other. Basically, you're seeing something that is happening in this period between the resurrection and the second coming. And uh, every, every one of those visions gives us something about that. And the last four were of chapters 12 through 22. Again, if, I'm sorry if you haven't seen the first two messages. I cover some of this stuff, most of it anyway. And... What we see in chapter 12, and I'll, I'll try to interpret that a little bit for you this morning, that Christ opposed by the dragon and his helpers, chapter 12 through 14, final wrath on the impenitent, terrible chapters. Um, you see God just dealing with those who have not repented, 15 and 16. And then in more detail, we'll look at the fall of Babylon and the beast. And I'm, I'm not apologizing for this, but I'm not going to deal with the last three chapters of the book this morning come back in the fall, and we'll deal with those things. Okay, so what does, does Christ oppose by the dragon and his helpers? How does that start out? We start out with a woman in childbirth, the great jag, a dragon, and then the child. And, and you see this whole beginning of things here. Um, now, the woman can be represented by Israel, could be represented by the church, I would maintain that it represents by all who have faith in God. And the great dragon, of course, is Satan, and the child is Jesus. Um, now, just, just bear with me just a minute here. Notice how that when, in these chapters, how when the child is taken up into heaven and is, really establishes his kingdom, that 
the devil, the dragon, is cast down to the earth. If you read this chapter in context, it really is really there. Okay, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head was a crown of twelve stars. And she was pregnant, and she cried out, being in labor and, and in pain to give, give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and his heads were the seven, on his heads were the seven crowns. And his tail swept a third of the stars of heaven and hurled them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour the child. And it says this following, it says, And she gave birth to a child, a male who was going to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and, his, and to his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that there would be, she, she would be nourished there oh, for 1,260 days. Now, that's verses 5 and 6 in um, First ones of the first four of chapter 12. This is verses 5 and 6. So I'm reading a lot. I wanted to read everything from chapter 12 through the end of the, the book this morning. Um, <clears throat> I've tried to read it at least twice a day. It started out really good, but I would get so caught up in things. It just got too, too much to manage, too much to hold on to. But what, what do we see here? This is the beginning. I'll put enmity between your seed and the seed of the, the devil and or the serpent and the seed of the woman. And that's what the whole scripture is about. You continually see where the seed of, of the devil, that demons and the devil himself, are always trying to kill the line. This is Saul trying to kill David. This is Cain and Abel. We're right out of the gate. They try to destroy the, the, the one who is offering good sacrifices. And God always responds by bringing about another one who will, who will keep this seed alive in the person of Seth. And you just continue to see these things as they go on. And in verses 7 through 9 of this chapter, it tells us, it says, And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels waged war, and they did not prevail, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And a great dragon, the great dragon, was thrown down, the serpent of old, who was called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. It gives us a great picture of what's going on in the world, what's happening in the world. This becomes... This becomes the, the, the realm for the, for the devil to do his work. And we'll see that, that the earth and the system of the earth shows up as Babylon. That's what the personification of this whole system it comes to us as Babylon. And we'll see that as we, we continue through this, this portion of Scripture. And then we hear this in verse 10. This is one of those songs that we don't sing any, any longer. It says, then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of, the, of our brothers and sisters. This is a new translation. Has been thrown down and the one, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. Right? There's the picture. There's the picture. What's the next verses say? They say this. They say, and they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even when faced with death. For this reason rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you with great wrath, knowing that he only has a short time. So out of this, basically you get this, this mini picture of this war. You'll see it repeated in the bowls of wrath and, and the angels who, who have uh, blowing trumpets in the next few chapters if you read those or when you read those. But here you have this picture of the war. And it says that who's they talking about here? They're talking about we who follow Jesus. Yeah? Okay, just want to make sure you're there. We're all following along. 
with bated breath, hanging on there. He says, they overcame him, that is the devil, because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even with face to death. So there's a threefold thing that helps us to understand how do we succeed in this war. Because as I mentioned the first and second week, Christians, we just don't believe we're in a war. In America, we just, we're just interested in what? Progress. Bigger and better. It, it's the underlying theme of American culture. We just want to get richer and we want to have more stuff. We're not interested in this war. We're not even interested in trying to bring other people into If we evangelize it because we stumble over the, the, the opportunity, not because we have planned from the morning, today I'm going to find somebody and share the gospel with him. I'm going to look for the opportunity. And as some people would say, I'm going to make the opportunity. Yeah? This is what, this is, if C.S. Lewis is right, this is what we're here for. This is what we're here for. We're not here to build buildings. We're not here to just get the perfect structure. We're not even here to get the perfect worship team. We're not even here to get the best preacher. We're here to win people to Jesus. And this is what the war is about. And the way that we overcome is because we identify with the blood of the Lamb. That Jesus shed his blood for me and sanctified me by his blood. He purchased us with his blood. Now, when you purchase something, what does that mean with the thing you purchased? You own it. Are you doing the math here? Are you following the logic? If he purchased us with his blood, what? He owns us, doesn't he? He owns us. Yeah. He's not borrowing us. He's not hiring us. He owns us. We're his possession. The scripture uses these words. Peter says this in his first epistle. He's saying it from what? From Exodus, where God purchased Israel, bought them with the blood of the Lamb, took them out of Egypt. Right? They were supposed to be a people for God's own possession. He says that we overcome, or we, they overcame because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even when faced to death. That is that what Jesus said, any man who wants to be my disciple has to take up his cross and what? Follow me. We want to say we're followers of Jesus, but did we die? Why the cross? Because the cross is the tool or the instrument that God uses to free us from our selfish ambitions to think that I am not purchased, I'm just used by God. I don't belong to him. He doesn't own me. We don't want to be owned by anybody. But Jesus purchased us. And when you confess Jesus as your Savior, basically you acknowledge that he purchased you with his blood. That he owns you. That was the, the, the covenant that was written. Not the contract. The covenant. Contracts are written for people who distrust other people. Covenants are written because of love and because of faithfulness. Yeah. The word of your testimony is, the best one I could find is Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Yeah. That's the best testimony I could have. Yeah. You know, God is really interested in words. You ever get that idea? The biggest complaint against Israel was that they disregarded the word of the Lord. It's the theme of God's complaint against Israel or Judah in Isaiah. They disregarded my word. They didn't believe my word. And Jesus is called what? The word of God. 
He's the word of redemption. He's the word of salvation. He's the word of a future, a future for eternity. He's the word of God for us. This is one of the hardest series I've ever had to do. It says, what do you leave out? What don't you say? Yeah. So in, in chapters 12, 13, and 14, this is the picture that you get. That, that the enmity is just right in your face. The devil wants to destroy the seed of the woman, and, but we know something else is going to happen. Because even in the beginning, God tells us, that the seed of the woman will crush his head. He will smite his heel. That is, the devil will strike his heel, but he will crush his head. One of the things I learned when I went to Guyana <clears throat> in South America, we would, go, we would basically, most of the time, we'd stay in the bush. We would actually take trips into town to speak at churches, but most of the time we worked in a training center. And they had, a, they had an expression, I um, have to be careful here, they have an expression that, that says, I beat you like a snake. And when I asked them, I said, you know, what do you mean by that? They said, we want to, you, when you're confronted by a poisonous snake, you don't cut his head off because he could still bite you. And the venom could still kill you. So what they would do is crush his head. I'll beat you like a snake. And knock you out. Yeah. And I thought, yeah, that's biblical. <clears throat> okay. So in chapters 15 and 16, you see the, the wrath of God on the impenitent. Angels carrying bowls of wrath, pouring them out, seeing all kinds of things happen in, ver in chapters 15 and 16. But then what you see in chapters 17 through 19 is, is the, the fall of Babylon and the beasts that come out of the sea and come off the land and all these things that are in this war. And if you, if you read through Revelation in one sitting and you don't come away with the idea that there is a war, going on. I don't know what you read. I don't know how you... I can get distracted easily, but this is really a little bit crazy. <clears throat> Some of the best verses in these chapters. It says, an angel shows up, and it says, and he cried out with a mighty voice, saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit. Now, watch this and a prison for every unclean and hateful bird. Come back in the fall. A place of demons and a, and a prison for every unclean spirit and a prison for every unclean and hateful bird. I was trying to find like a typo somewhere. And I don't know. There are some things you could go off on on this, but you won't. So here's the announcement. What? Who is Babylon? Babylon is the harlot that seduces the church. She is the center of every sensual thing that can, that can attack a human being. Every sensual thing that can tempt us from stop following Jesus and get caught up in things in our lives. It's amazing. I'm, my wife and I, we, we sit down at night sometimes and we try to watch mindless TV. Something that isn't going to distract us too much, but just something mindless. And it's amazing what, what people are interested in. We have contests on who could bake the best cake. Give them thousands of dollars. On, on children up to the age of 12 or 13, we put them under such pressure to see if they could produce a three-course meal and get a quarter of a million dollars. And people are cheering like they have won the Super Bowl. 
Like, that's a big thing. But we have all these things, and what do they do for us? I will eat almost anything. I admit that. But that's because I spent 15 months in the Mekong Delta. And you would think there are certain things I wouldn't eat. Cottage cheese. Never. I don't want to be in the same room with it. I don't know if it's the texture or whatever, but, but I'll eat almost anything else. Yeah. And I watch this, this contest, and I'm thinking, like, that person's going to have an identity because of this. Yeah. Is that going to be the word of their testimony? You think of all of it, baseball, football, basketball, um, track, field, all these things that we put such high esteem on. And yet we have one who was never an athlete, never wrote a book, and as far as we know, never cooked a meal, who triumphed over evil. Listen, perspective is a very important thing in looking at life. What's the perspective here? How, how do we really judge how this fits in with everything else? What would you give your life for? I'm always interested when they ask the person, what does it mean to you if you win this? And they say something like, this means the world to me. And I think, Jesus, help us. If they asked me that question, I'd say, I'd be a little bit richer. Materially. I don't know that I could get richer spiritually. Yeah. See, the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And it does give us perspective. Perhaps this is one of the reasons why there are so many different views that try to see things in all kinds of distortion. There are some who would like to put all these events in the past. There are some that would like to put all these in the future. And a few of us want to say, this is what's going on right here and now. That we are dealing with an enemy who wants to destroy us. He wants to take away our lamp. He wants us to take away our word of testimony but if you read the book you realize you can win because of the blood of the lamb because of the word of your testimony and not loving your life even to death verse 20 of chapter 18 says rejoice over her O heaven and saints and apostles and prophets for God has given judgment for you against her See, unless God does something to the world system, to the, to the harlot, to Babylon, we would never win. We'd be outdone. And what we start to realize at the end of chapter 18 is that there are songs of praise, there's a wedding feast, there's worship, there's a decisive battle, and there's this other verse, I call it the summons the buzzard verse. Yeah, it's... Think about it. <clears throat> now here, think of the echo here. And the light of a lamp will, of her lamp will never shine in you again. And the voice of the groom and the bride will never be heard in you again. For your merchants were the powerful people of the earth because of all the nations were deceived by your witchcraft. Yeah. <sighs> All right, <clears throat> got to move on here. And I saw in heaven opened, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. Now he's not responding to war, he's waging war. And we're going to see how he wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many crowns, and he has the name written on him which no one knows except himself. And he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Guess who? Yeah. 
And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. How many of you like to ride horses? Now, this is figurative. You realize this. This is what John understood in his day, that this is how you waged war. That it was armies riding horses were always the ones who had the, the advantage in any warfare. He talks about their fine linen, their white and clean, following on these horses. And out of his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he might strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce, fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has the name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. There's no question about who this is, who's leading this, who's, who's a, the one whose mouth has a sword coming out of it who's going to rule with a rod of iron. This is Jesus waging war on those who would seduce us. This is Babylon at this point. We're not dealing with the devil here. He's just dealing with the adulteress. And how do we succeed in this battle? Get into the Word of God. Realizing that this is not just something you do as part of your daily routine to read the Word, but you want that Word to change you. You want it to, to change the way you think about reality, about your love for God, and put things in perspective. This is what I believe the revelation was for. If I could just rehearse this once before, once again, that the first few chapters of Revelation, John's giving words from Jesus to the churches, that's because they were being persecuted. They were losing hope. Their faith was being challenged. There are all kinds of things going on in them. And then he has this great revelation. What was it for? It was to bolster their faith. It was to infuse in them, hey, God is in control of this thing. Not the way we like to think that God is in control, but he's in control of this army. He's in control of this fight. We've read the end of the book. Right? We know he wins. <clears throat> Here's the summons, the buzzards. He says, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, All the birds that fly in mid-heaven, come assemble for the great feast of God. That's something I would like to see. He's summonsing the birds of heaven, and these are the buzzards. This is the word for birds that, that's there that come down, and what do they do? They eat the flesh of dead things. They're not birds of prey like eagles or osprey or, or hawks. These are birds that basically eat the dead. So there, that'd be a great title for a sermon. Summons the buzzards. I'd want to listen to it. <clears throat> But he's saying, there's going to be a great feast because we're going to destroy Babylon. We're going to destroy this, this entity that exists in our world that basically is against the church. It's, it's John that writes, friendship with the world is enmity with God. That way, you know, we, we're, we're in the world, we're supposed to be in the world to reach those who don't know Jesus, but we're not to become friends with the world or join to the world in a way that, that subverts our own faith, that takes our, our hope in Jesus away, our relationship with Jesus away. And don't raise your hand. But how many times have we been tempted in a way that we just give up a little bit? Just a little bit. Yeah. And it's just always there. Yeah. And we give it up, and we give it up, and we give it up, and finally we find ourselves in a place that we don't like. Yeah. Hopefully, we find it. That's what Babylon is. That's what the world is. And we live in, in the most prosperous nation on the earth. And it's our privilege to support those ministries 
because God has made us rich and we can help them. I can't tell you how much the, the brothers and sisters in South Africa are so blessed by what we do for them. They are really blessed for it. They can do things that they only prayed about. God, give us the means to do it. And we become the answer to their prayer. Yeah. And they're able to do things now that they weren't able to do before. If you watch the video that John Grobler and, and Tilly was in it and also Suzette, <clears throat> They were here back in October last year. We were able to bless them and have fellowship with them. And I was so glad for that to happen. I've been going to South Africa for 14 years. 14 years. Yeah, since 2010. That was my first trip. And that was a trip that changed me in 2010. I saw what God was doing in that country with these people. And God has just continually opened doors for me and given me brothers and sisters and build relationships with all of them because it's a blessing of God. But we're able to do that. But with, with, with great wealth comes great responsibility. The same thing with great opportunity, responsibility. What do we do with it? How do we take care of it? My wife, who most of you know, she would give everything away in our house. We've been married 52 years, but we still have stuff. That's only because I say, I need that. <laughs> but she, Jesus, you know what? I pray that we become more like her. Yeah. That we become open handed with our generosity. Because God has no limits. I realize when I'm stingy, it's because I don't believe God has no limits. It's a terrible awakening. But he has no limits. You give it away, he can replenish it. Yeah. Tremendous thing. But we have to be, you know, in the context here is Babylon has defiled the church. That this war, we have to recognize this. Yeah. Can we use the systems? Absolutely. Can we live in the world? Absolutely. Should we be part of the world? Absolutely not. We've got to learn those, those things, whatever they are. Because what we have to be careful of is that they seduce us. And that's the two things the devil will do. And you see this always in the book of Revelation. I've been saying this for as long as I've been preaching. The devil will either seduce you or persecute you. That's your relationship with him. He either wants to seduce you or persecute you. And if he can't seduce you, he probably will persecute you. I don't think he just starts out persecuting. I think he first thinks, let me seduce this one. Let me find out how to seduce him. And when you won't give in to seduction, he'll persecute you. That's why Paul says that everybody who lives a godly life will what? Suffer persecution. Those are your two choices. Yeah. It's so like I said, probably 2,000 times, maybe three. You go forward get attacked. You quit, you lose. Those are the only two choices. Been doing this for 50 years, been looking for other things. Give me a third choice here, God. Give me a, just show me another one. No, you go forward, you get attacked. Okay, so let's sum this up again. There is enmity between the woman's seed and the seed of the serpent. By faith, you have become a child of Abraham, a brother in Christ or sister in Christ, you are part of that seed that the devil wants to destroy. He can't beat Jesus anymore. He knows his time is short, but he will still, because of his nature, he will still work against the church. He'll still work against trying to destroy as many as he can. And we have to come to this perspective of what we see also always has something behind it. Remember those first three 
sections that we dealt with the first week or so. They're, they're the seen world. That is the enmity between the church and the world. But now we're into the unseen realm. What's going on behind the scenes? What's happening behind the scenes? There is a war in heaven. There is a fight going on for the souls of men. And our job is to win and bring as many people as we can into this stream that goes to the kingdom of God. And now what we're living in is the already and not yet. I've got to fix that before it drives me crazy. I was doing it this morning. <clears throat> the already but not yet. That what we have today, all the blessings that we have today are a, a down payment of what God has for us. Already we have been gifted with this salvation, but not yet. It hasn't been consummated yet where our bodies be transformed. Our whole being will be, be resurrected to a newness in life and a new heavens and a new earth. So we have that which has been fulfilled in Christ, but not yet that which is consummated. Or a living in is the fulfillment, the promises. They're a down pay payment. They're the earnest of what God has for us. This is the already and not yet. So this is given to us as an opportunity to see something that is unseen. To realize that God is at work even in our fallen world, in our situation. And that it's very easy for the, for the enemy to put temptations in front of us, to stop us from doing things, to distract us. I go back to that quote by C.S. Lewis. All these things, if we're not winning people to Jesus, is a waste of our time. Amen? Amen.